Previously on Scandalous, Subway Vigilante. Back then in 1984, crime in New York City was awful. Gets boarded the number two subway going downtown. The incident began when he sat down in the subway car across from four guys. Troy Canty got right up into his face and said, give me five dollars, and kind of smiled like as if you had a choice. Bernard Getz couldn't fight his way out of a wet paper bag, so he depended on the power of the gun. The radios confirmed that four people shot in the subway and they were looking for the shooter. He was romanticized to some degree in the press. He was called the subway vigilante. When he surrendered in Concord, New Hampshire, you suddenly see he's basically a nervous, kind of meek figure. He thought that this was the beginning of a movement in New York to arm citizens. Getz had to argue self-defense because there was no other way to go. There was no other defense. A New York County grand jury today indicted Bernard Getz on four counts of attempted murder in the second degree. The story will come out, at least in a trial. The whole story comes out. The subway systems in 1984 were a mess. He stood up to violence on the subway. When he surrendered, you suddenly see that he's not this superhero human type person. He had been a nobody. And then all of a sudden, he was number one, second, and none. Beginning to shoot openly on the subways, that's a safety issue for everybody. Black people were concerned that this was sending a message that it was okay for white people to shoot them. Getz's attorney, Barry Slotnick's pretrial motion to dismiss the grand jury indictments was denied. But this wasn't all bad news for Getz. Judge Crane dismissed nine of the original 13 counts based on the prosecution's explanation of the New York self-defense statute to the second grand jury. This left only the charges of gun possession and reckless endangerment. A few weeks later, Darrell Cabey, the youth who had fallen into a coma after sustaining multiple gunshot wounds at the hands of Bernard Getz, was released from St. Vincent's Hospital with reports of severe brain damage. Daryl Cabey was not competent to stand trial. Daryl Cabey wasn't competent to testify. Um, you know, he was permanently and irrevocably brain damaged and had absolutely no memory or knowledge of what had happened to him or why it had happened. Daryl Cabey is the only one that you could put an asterisk next to because when he received that second shot, the one that sub subsequently supposedly paralyzed him, like I said, he had been neutralized as a threat. Meanwhile, the other three youths, Troy Canty, Barry Allen, and James Ramser, continued to engage in criminal behavior across the city. All three ended up in jail or under court supervision for unrelated offenses after the subway incident. Barry Allen pleaded guilty to snatching a woman's necklace. He was sentenced to five years in prison. Troy Canty was in a drug rehabilitation program to kick his cocaine habit. In March 1985, James Ramsey was found guilty of rape, robbery, sodomy, sexual abuse, assault, criminal use of a firearm, and possession of stolen property. James Ramsey subsequently raped at least two women that I know of, one personally being my cousin, Damaris James. She pointed him out um, because he violated her viciously uh, in, in an apartment stairwell with, with some other guys. He was, all, he was subsequently convicted of raping a pregnant woman in the same manner, and he received, uh, I believe it was 25 years. Ramsey was incarcerated by the time jury selection in The People vs. Bernhard Getz was set to begin. Two years had passed since the subway shooting had polarized the Big Apple. Finding an impartial jury would be a major obstacle. The jury selection is always very important. In fact, it's probably the most important stage of the trial. And there is an art form that uh, has now developed in jury selection. They start calling people from the jury pool, as it's called, to try to find out what their inclinations might be in the case. We are going through a pre-screening process in order to find 80 citizens who will be fair and impartial in hearing the facts of this case. That's all that we are doing in the courtroom at the present moment. The pre-screening process was uh, quite enlightening. We realized we were going to have to go through a lot of potential jurors. The judge ordered about 500 people 
to come into the room, and we divided them into groups of about 20. There are very few cases that have the high publicity content as the Bernhard Getz case. So this is the proper way of doing it. Questioning jurors individually, alone, so that they're not pressured, so they can give us true and candid answers. And what are they saying? We want, we want, we want 12 fair jurors. What are they and every Friday, in the robing room for the court, there would be the judge, the prosecutor, Mr. Getz and myself. And we would do a pre-screening of these 20 or 25 individuals. And the uh, rule was, if either side objected, they were out. When I got to the jury pool the day I was summoned, is when I found out that A, this was not the usual process, and that B, we were only being considered for the Bernard Getz trial, and this room was packed. When Getz himself entered, 10% of those people, maybe more, applauded, clapped out loud when he walked in. He was clearly a hero to some of the people who were, uh, going to be contemplated potentially as his jury. The jury selection process was further complicated by rising racial tensions in the city. We had one gentleman who came in, and it was my turn to question. He was an African-American gentleman, and he was giving all the right answers. And then Roy Innes walks into the courtroom, and I saw this juror give him a look like Innes was a serial killer. That's when I knew. Thankfully, we were able to eliminate him in time. You know, it was very polarizing. I mean, either you were for um, the quote-unquote subway vigilante, Bernard Goetz, or you were somehow felt that he had um, violated the civil rights of the four young men that he had shot. There was a lot of uh, animosity and a lot of racial tension uh, before and after the Goetz case. This came during the period when you had uh, Michael Griffith, who was a young man who was chased in uh, Howard Beach, Queens, and chased by a white mob and run over on, uh, in the highway. It was a very tumultuous time when it came to race relations. The jurors are saying, basically, that they know the facts, that they've read the facts, everybody knows about the facts, that they will be fair and impartial, that they're gonna listen to the evidence, but obviously, everybody knows about the case, a la the media. Intense media coverage made it impossible to find a New Yorker who hadn't heard about Bernie Getz and hadn't already formulated his own ideas about what happened in the subway car that day. Of the 106 potential jurors that showed up at court, 20 were dismissed. The remaining 86 were subjected to a final screening. If we can abort and sort out those jurors that are not telling the truth, those jurors that are walking into that jury box lying because they have some sense that this may be a racist circumstance or they have some sense that he's a bad person, if I can get those people out of the jury box and get a fair and impartial jury, we're going to win the case without question. Good evening. It took the biggest courtroom they have to start the Bernhard Getz trial today. When Getz shot four young men on the subway, it caused a sensation around the world, and that, of course, means a crowd just to find enough jurors. And it means a big pack of reporters ready to tell the world if Getz will have to go to jail, maybe up for 25 years, or whether the jury will believe that he was a frightened victim. As the trial approached, reporters questioned Getz everywhere he went. And more often than not, the man now known as the subway vigilante gave them just the answers they were hoping for. Bernhard Getz chatted and seemed somewhat relaxed at his lawyer's office early this morning, even though for the last two years, the 39-year-old has had to live with attempted murder charges. Today, Getz moved one step closer to going to trial, jury selection. But before he went inside the courthouse, the man who's been called the subway gunman reiterated his belief that crime victims should fight back. When, when a person walks on the streets, there's a, you know, or travels on the subway or goes anywhere in New York, there's a possibility that they're going to be killed, injured, or maimed. It was very hard to keep him from commenting. Bernard Getz did not help the situation because he didn't seem to understand that people were taking sides on this issue now because of the color of his skin, not because of the victimization that he went through. The things I said, I believe, and I still do believe. Um, in hindsight, uh, I don't think I should have said them because it, uh, it stirred up everything again. Bernie, this way. On April 27, 1985, Bernard Getz finally got his day in court. The scene outside the courthouse was nuts. Bernard Getz, KKK, different name, same game. 
It was just constant protests on both sides. You had supporters of Bernard Goetz, you had the Guardian Angels and Curtis Sliwa. We can't condemn victims when they minded their own business. We have to attack the predators. Then you have people on the other side who are against Goetz, led by Al Sharpton. We hope to see Goetz convicted because he presumed that because they were black, they were criminal. We were up front in providing security for Bernard Goetz so that he could get safely to and from the court, join his legal team. And I can see in the faces and the minds of the general population that had used the subways and had been victimized themselves, they were somewhat torn now. And they started taking sides based on the color of their skin. I will be prosecuting those four thugs that ventured upon Bernhard Goetz and meant to do him ill will and rob him. I don't understand why they weren't prosecuted. With Getz inside the courtroom and chaos brewing just outside, jurors heard the opening statements. Assistant District Attorney Gregory Waples told the jury, evidence will show that the defendant shot these four teens not because he feared for his life, but because of a twisted, self-righteous sense of morality. The prosecutor was arguing that he did not act reasonably, that there were alternatives available to him. He could have just pulled his weapon and didn't have to shoot. That was the essence of the prosecutor's uh, position. The defense would need to persuade the jury that Bernard Goetz was neither a Rambo nor a vicious predator, but that he had acted in self-defense, a difficult feat given the complicated legal nuances of that defense. What Slotnick showed in the trial is it's not society's uh, view of what happened, it's what was in Bernard Goetz's mind. Would a reasonable person have reasonable fear that, that his life or was in danger or that he would be harmed. It's a night when the jury is digesting what it heard about Bernhard Getz today. This was the opening of the trial New York has been waiting for. It's the case New Yorkers have been hotly debating among themselves for over two years. Is Getz a vicious vigilante or a victim fighting back? My father always said, what if Bernie didn't have a gun that day and happened to be a martial arts expert? What would people have done? You know, if he had disarmed and laid everybody out just using his hands, would he still be considered, you know, a vigilante? Or would he just be a victim who could take very good care of himself? The divide amongst New Yorkers over Bernie Getz was growing wider, but it was about to become an abyss. No one made a sound at Bernhard Getz's trial today, not a whisper, not a cough. They were fascinated by what they heard on a tape recording. For the first time in public, gets his own voice was telling what happened on that afternoon when the shooting started on that subway car. The prosecution played a two-hour tape that Getz had given the New Hampshire police a week after the shooting. On that tape, Getz sounded nervous, but was fired up to tell his story. The interesting part of the confession is that he proceeds with the confession despite not having been given his Miranda warnings. That was the first time he was sitting down and actually talking to somebody about it. And he wanted to. This was not somebody who got caught. It's somebody who walked into the police station. He says, I was a crazy, sick uh, animal. I had rage. I wanted to kill them. I would have gouged their eyes out if I could. And there are other sides in which he t says that he was scared and the then he knew that they were going to play with him, and he was terrified. Yet, once Getz described taking the additional shot that wounded Daryl Kaby, both sides fell silent. I was so out of control. I was the, the barrel against his forehead and fire. It was an expose of an anguished man in mental, emotional torment. I think the tapes are clear. Bernhard Getz was being robbed, and he justifiably shot the robbers. That he says on the tapes, there's truth, there's honesty to what's on the tapes. So clearly, there's no question, the best witness in this case has been presented. That's Bernhard Getz on tape. For the first time since that fateful night, Troy Canty, the teenager who had asked Getz for the $5, and Bernard Getz, the man who shot him more than two years before, came face to face. Here's what I remember thinking about Troy. I could see right away why he was the leader of this group of friends. Dressed in a suit, tie, and protected by immunity, Canty took the stand. Questioning began with Prosecutor Gregory Waples' cross-examination. 
At first, Waples asked Canty questions to reveal a 21-year-old's criminal history as a shoplifter and petty thief who supported himself by stealing up to $200 a day from video machines. Canty admitted his friends were carrying screwdrivers, but he was not. The teens intended to use the tools for breaking into video machines. But as the subway approached Chambers Street Station, a man got on the train. That man was Getz. Canty testified that his hands were empty, he had no screwdrivers, no weapons, and that as far as he remembers, the other three teens were sitting behind him. Then, Canty showed the jury how Getz turned his back to him and went inside his jacket. The teen told the jury Getz then pulled out a gun and started firing. Waples, Canty's attorney, claimed the young man was merely panhandling, while Getz had insisted it was robbery. I felt that he was being honest in his testimony. He felt no threat, having been given complete immunity. The prosecution's objective was to present Canty as a cleaned-up young man and a cooperative witness. He struck me as being pretty bright and capable, perhaps in a different life, of uh, great success in a productive life. I think at the time, Troy Canty, an aspiring chef, you know, he really wanted to go on and become uh, one of the top chefs in the world. He was, you know, he was, yeah, right. So why was he riding the number two train vicking people? After a short recess, the defendant's lawyer, Barry Slotnick, launched an attack on Canty's character and credibility. And Troy Canty was dressed up in a suit. I was able, before the trial, to find four pictures of these kids, one of each, arrest mugshots, or in the case of Ram Soar, a particularly nasty photo. I had blown them up to poster size. I had them on easels. Every morning the jury came in and looked at them. Waples would take them down, I would put them back up, and we had this running game throughout the trial. Slotnick highlighted the numerous conflicting statements Canty had made to detectives. He forgot every statement he gave to every police officer that the four of us were robbing the white guy, we surrounded him. He forgot all of that. I guess I'll just have to bring the police officers in to remind the jury and show them. Troy Canty testified that Getz fired the five shots in rapid succession. What Slotnick called the key to the case. He said that rapid succession leaves no place for this lone so-called execution shot that paralyzed Darrell Cabey. Following Canty's testimony, tension in the courtroom reached new heights when the next teenager was called to the witness stand. The most dramatic and surprising moment in the trial of Bernhard Getz came late in the day when prosecutor Gregory Waples called James Ramsour to the stand. Ramsour was serving 8 to 25 years in prison for a rape and robbery he committed after he was shot by Getz. Ramsour swaggered to the stand, his hands in his pockets, and gestured away the Bible held by a court officer for the oath. Ramsour said, I refuse to take the stand. Ramsour, I think, came off pretty tough. Yeah, he had a real chip on his shoulder about the whole thing. He seemed more cold-blooded, more dangerous. And in fact, he was convicted of some pretty horrific, violent crimes that were unrelated to Getz. If they had subsequently been convicted, or at least um, contained, then they would not have been able to go on to commit those other crimes. My cousin wouldn't have been victimized, the other lady wouldn't have been victimized, you know, and I'm sure there were other victims along the way. As a juror, we were trying to separate what he may or may not have done somewhere else with what we were looking at. Like Canty, James Ramser had been granted immunity, but when Judge Stephen Crane ordered him to take the oath, he refused. The judge had no choice but to charge him with criminal contempt. He was escorted out in handcuffs by court officers. He doesn't want to testify because he feels that since he's been involved with this case, uh, the, tr the system uh, is treating him very badly. I think the jurors seeing Mr. Ramsor understanding and seeing Mr. Canty and his testimony uh, speaks for itself. Without the promise of immunity, Barry Allen invoked his Fifth Amendment privilege. With only Canty's testimony to review, eyewitnesses affirmed that the shots came one after another in rapid succession. The evidence started to unfold when each subway witness talked about gunshots in rapid succession. That's when I knew we were on a good path. Each one of these witnesses testified to a version of facts that were at odds with Getz's own statement. There was no fifth shot at point blank range. But didn't he say it to the officer in, in uh, New Hampshire? Concord. Yes, he did. He was also stressful in a state of shock, and that's something that we may get into at a later date. Before Getz surrendered in New Hampshire, he called his neighbor of over nine years, Myra Friedman. 
Friedman recounted her conversation with the subway gunman to the jury. Friedman knew Getz had committed the subway shootings because he called her to tell her about it in detail. She taped the conversation. A journalist and writer by trade, Friedman had been working on a story at the time of the incident and had her tape recorder handy. Those guys, I'm almost sure, almost sure are, are vicious, savage people. What I did, I responded in a vicious and savage way. It was a surprise today when Prosecutor Waples didn't ask her about the call or play the tape for the jury. Getz's attorney, Barry Slotnick, says he knows why the prosecution didn't introduce the tape as evidence. I think they show uh, Mr. Getz's state of mind, the fact that he was surrounded, the fact that he was about to be robbed, and everything that we have indicated to be true is consistent. Our father felt that, he, that the tapes helped him, that the tapes humanized him. He was going to be the hunter and not the rabbit anymore. The jury had heard the voice of Bernard Goetz echo through the courtroom in his initial interview with New Hampshire police, but now it was time to see parts of the confession. This would be the jurors' only opportunity to observe and hear the subway gunman. Oh, you know, just when I hear New Yorkers speak, uh, I don't even want to... The dramatic videotape was presented by the prosecution. Getz appeared uncomfortable, angry, rambling at times. I look at the bureaucracy of New York, it makes me sick. He was hostile towards his questioners because he didn't understand why they were trying to arrest and prosecute him. He thought he did what was right and appropriate under the circumstances. You are so far removed from the reality, and yet they send you here as a professional, as a professional, to investigate this. It's beyond belief. And Why these four? Why these four? Oh, oh, isn't that beautiful? You asked the question in an intellectual way. Why these four? Why these four? I didn't pick out these four. I never met those guys. I told you, you have it in here. I never met them. Getz described the moment he was approached by Troy Canty. The guy, his exact words were, give me $5. That's bullshit. The robbery has nothing to do with it. When I saw his smile and the look in his eye, I knew what they were going to do. What is your interpretation of that? I can't get inside your head. What they were going to do is enjoy me for a while. They were going to beat the fucking shit out of me. Because of the videotape, the jury was able to see him in a sympathetic light. And you can better put yourself in his shoes. So I believed he was really trying to be honest in his videotape confessions. The electronics technician showed no remorse. He called himself a cold-blooded murderer and acknowledged that he had fired a second time at one of the youths point blank. I pulled out the piece. I just started firing. As I told the fellow in there, it's unimportant to look at what you're firing at. You just target images in your mind. You fire, it is, it is, to use his expression, you, you, you aim for the center of the mass. You run, you keep moving. All you have to do is to be uh, faster than they are. I ran up to the first two to check them who were on the ground, the first two that I had shot. And they were taken care of. I think in his mind at that time, that, that was his own defensive mechanism, though, to get that off his chest and, and feel good about himself and, uh, and just say crazy stuff. I think Bernie is a guy who has lacked a lot of self-confidence. And I think that kind of fed his fear. I went to him the second time, and I looked at him. And he can't verify this because he was probably out of it by then. If I had shot him or if he wasn't, I don't know. And I said, you seem to be doing all right. Here's another. He was basically recounting what he was fantasizing he did as opposed to what he actually did. When you look at, at his confession tape, there, there were a lot of things that I think he embellished himself, even to his own detriment. I wanted to kill those guys. I wanted to maim those guys. I wanted to make them suffer in every way I could. The prosecution's videotape really works to the benefit of the defense here. The defense can get themselves into Bernie Getz's head. He comes across in that videotape, whatever you think about him, however strange he seems, however eccentric, however quirky he seems, he does seem honest, that he's telling the truth. In terms of details, in terms of responsibility, you can accuse me of a lot of things, 
okay? Because I know in my heart what I, what I was, what I was. What, they didn't die, well that's God, what God has wanted evidently if there is a God. But I in my heart was a murderer. What I recall most profoundly was he looked and sounded like a nut. And his account of what transpired was, was absolutely filled with his own anger and his rage and, and very little to do with whether or not he was being victimized on the subway. He seemed to be a man preoccupied with avenging perceived past injustices. On May 19th, after a five-day recess, James Ramser returned to the courtroom to erase the contempt charges he had originally faced, but his cross-examination turned ugly. He wasn't going to answer any questions that the cross-examining defense counsel was asking him. They went at it, and Slotnick would stand there, and he would kind of egg him on in his professorial kind of way. When James Ramsour left the courtroom today after one and a half hours of cross-examination by Getz's attorney, Barry Slotnick, he had at least five counts of contempt of court against him for not answering Slotnick's questions. I have the option of asking that his testimony be stricken. I just don't have the heart to do that. I'd like the jury to see and be able to remind them on summation what James Ramsour was all about. The Gang of Four, he was one of them. Ramsour, when he testified, fit a stereotype of what some people thought, you know, a mugger would be. After two days of Ramsour's torturous testimony, the prosecution rested. But the young man had much more to say. A week later, he gave a damning jailhouse interview. I don't think he felt that he was being robbed. He snapped. He, he was looking for it. He was, to me, he was out to it. From where I see it, he was out to do this. Slotnick says this is a clear case of self-defense. He thinks that the evidence clearly shows that Bernie Getz was justified in firing those bullets, that he was facing a serious threat and reacted as someone, including the jurors, might if they were in his same shoes. The defense attorney contended Getz was an unreliable witness and his account of the fifth shot was a figment of his imagination. Getz's legal team had one last trick up their sleeve. It just dawned upon me that you couldn't conceptualize how small the space was on the train to allow for an understanding of greater intimidation on Getz's part at that time. And the only way that that could be accomplished was to go into the same type of subway car and imagine your Getz. We went down into an unused tunnel and actually spent time on the same kind of car so we could get a sense of how close it was. It's much smaller than the current subway cars. The feeling of claustrophobia, being trapped there with nowhere to go, especially since it's moving. You know, you had to experience that to appreciate it. The jury was allowed to just walk around, having heard most of the evidence, wherever they wanted to go in the train. They knew where the witnesses were supposedly sitting. Some of them sat there, some of them sat where they thought Getz would have been. It was interesting to go through the space and kind of play that scenario out. As the trial was winding down and the jurors were back from their class field trip, the two sides prepared their summations. Slotnick held the microphone with both hands and speaking to the jury in a soft, barely audible voice, told them that prosecutor Greg Waples had come to court without a case and asked the jury to let Waples leave court without a conviction. During a four-hour closing argument, the prosecution explained that Getz's own confession spoke for itself, and it was clear Getz wanted to murder his presumed assailants. Waples often spoke with uncharacteristic passion in his voice. He told the jury that in the subway car on December 22nd, 1984, Getz was a vigilante, an emotional powder keg obsessed with crime. Waple said that Getz was a suspicious, paranoid individual who was filled with self-righteous anger. After a seven-week trial, the jury heard Judge Stephen Crane's charge and began deliberations. All the passion that's been poured onto the Getz case by the opposing lawyers was scraped away this afternoon. The judge did that. That's his job. It's called charging the jury, laying out the law step by step, 
to help them decide with their heads, not their hearts. It was just a tedious process going through, you know, each charge and uh, I know we voted several times. It took a couple of days to just get through everything and until everybody was comfortable and we were all on the same page. We went around the room and everybody just got to have their say. What were they thinking and feeling? This was the first time any of us got to share what we actually thought about the case with each other. And we all cared about each other at this point. We were all this tight little group that were all working on the same project together. And I remember we were very divided. For Bernhard Getz, the waiting had just begun. But for the jurors, the time had finally come to decide Getz's fate. Following four days of deliberation, the jury acquitted Bernhard Getz on all major charges in the shooting of four teens on a New York City subway train. He was convicted of only one minor weapons charge. Everybody was cheering or jeering, or it seems like it might have been a combination of both. Because there were people on both sides of this the whole time. Being in the courtroom and delivering the verdict was one of the most incredibly intense moments I've ever been witness to. The tension amongst the reporters, the judge, the attorneys, gets us, everybody was like electrified. The verdict may have legally justified Getz's actions, but it also had larger implications for the entire city. Many speculated that the incident was racially charged since Getz was white and the 14s were black. They saw the verdict as yet another setback for race relations in New York. People made him a folk hero. He's a modern day Robin Hood. He's some kind of great saint. And we think that that is absolutely wrong, that we are, we are, we are glorifying, dignifying, and honoring the wrong type of activity, and this should stop. A jury with uh, two blacks uh, and an Hispanic on it decided uh, that uh, his defense of uh, self-defense uh, was such that they accepted it. Now, we have to accept their judgment even if we don't uh, agree with it. Had it not been for that one conviction on the illegal handgun charge, there would have been major problems in the streets for weeks to come. Bernard Getz had no real supporters in the black community. And it was one of the first times that I had seen such a stark disparity in reaction between the white community and the black community, which said a lot more about the deep-seated racial divisions in New York City than it actually said about the shooting itself. People looked at this case and our verdict as being a decision being made about their lives and their issues in our city, when it was just about this case. With many citizens both angry and fearful, 25 black men joined forces with Reverend Al Sharpton to patrol the New York City subway system from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. in an effort to reduce crime that they felt disproportionately affected their community. The general attitude was that uh, law enforcement was also racially biased. It made me fearful for my kids. I am trying to re rear a boy, a young man, into manhood who can stand tall, who can be proud of who he is and what he is. And if he can't stand up and look at white people, men or women, in the eye without feeling, without feeling like they're intimidated or ready to run or ready to harm him in some way, how can I protect him? Time passed, but the collective anger resulting from Getz's acquittal continued to spread. Barry Slotnick, Getz's defense lawyer, was attacked outside his office in Lower Manhattan by an unidentified man who fled on a scooter. Slotnick suffered a broken wrist, in addition to numerous cuts and bruises. So the trial itself, guilt or innocence, is in the hands of the jury. But then sentencing is in the hands of the judge. And Crane decided to compromise on the one-year rule and gave him six months. Getz was sentenced to six months in jail. One year's psychiatric treatment, five years probation, 200 hours community service, and a $5,000 fine. He ought to kiss his rabbit foot, thank his lucky stars, and praise his God. Leave him alone. Putting him on Rikers Island is just going to make it that much worse for others who might contemplate fighting back when they're in the victim position. I hope it doesn't send out the message that vigilantes get rewarded and get slaps on the wrist for shooting down four young black men and sending one 
to a lifetime of paralysis. I thought that was appropriate myself, uh, simply because I believe that everyone who has uh, an illegal gun, I believe they should never get less than a year. It sends a, a bad message, a chilling message, to decent citizens who must defend themselves, defend their lives against criminals. I think what he did was totally, was totally right. People, people do worse things, and, and they get off for probation. Well, one year, well, at least you're doing time. You should do more than that, really. We're going to argue that uh, prison for Bernhard Goetz is totally inappropriate because it is unduly harsh. It is psychologically oppressing. He's been a prisoner of the system for four years, and that uh, a non-custodial sentence is, is much more appropriate. An appellate court affirmed the conviction and amended the sentence to one year in jail without probation. When asked by Judge Crane whether he had anything to say, Getz stood up. This case uh, is really more about deterioration in society than it is about me. Gregory Lapels uh, seems to be concerned that society needs to be protected from me. And uh, I don't believe that's the case. Society needs to be protected from criminals. The confessed gunman served eight months. Our trial it affected everyone in New York emotionally because everyone used the subways. Everybody was either black, white, or someone of color in between who was affected by race relations one way or the other. Safety and violence in New York was a universal experience for all of us. So everyone was very emotional about this case. And I think that's why it still has relevance today. Bernard Getz served more than half a year behind bars, but he was nowhere near being a free man. A week after his release, he was back in court. There were no demonstrators or heavy police presence this time around. The 1984 shooting had left Daryl Cabey permanently paralyzed. Cabey's family had filed a civil suit seeking $50 million. 11 years later, in 1996, Cabey's suit was finally on the docket. The most important thing about the civil trial is it took place in 1996. And the city was a very different place than it was in, in, in 1984. Things were getting better in New York. Crime was no longer the number one concern of the citizenry, and was not even the number one concern of white people. So the city had changed, and, and you were taking this, this racist episode, this, this spasm of white rage and white lash and anger, and trying it in, in, a, in a very different city. Ron Kuby, Kaby's attorney, asked the jury, largely comprised of blacks and Hispanics, whether they had ever experienced discrimination and if they believed that gun permits were too easily obtainable. A Bronx County jury, it's mostly minorities. The victims were minority. This is the only county that acquits people who shoot cops. Getz's new attorney, Darnay Hoffman, tried to stay away from the topic of race. Instead, he questioned whether the minority jurors could look into the neighbor's eyes in the event of a not guilty verdict. If you're a defense lawyer, what do you do? You try to soften it up for the jury. Yeah, he said some crazy things. You know, he's been over the top, but you know, we don't want you to focus on, on that. We want you to focus on something else. I mean, I understand that as, as a strategy. It just tends not to be one that works very well. Both lawyers presented their opening arguments. They gave diametrically different versions of the same event. He shoots Troy Cannon. And he doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop to see what else is going on. Has the threat, whatever threat he perceived, has that been stopped? The purpose of the civil case was to show the world just what a bad guy Bernard Goetz was and to show just what sort of of crazy, racist monster that white people had embraced out of their, their fear and out of their hatred and out of their insecurity. Boom! He shoots the other young man. And again, he doesn't pause to see the results of his handiwork. Maybe he can stop shooting. Then Mr. Getz turns to his right, and he sees a young man 
in Mr. Getz's words, trying to get through the steel walls of the subway car. But of course he can't. Boom! Shoots him too. And then he turns to see Mr. Cabey. What's Mr. Cabey doing at this time? Well, Mr. Getz is going to tell you what he was doing. Mr. Cabey was standing there holding the strap on the subway car, pretending that he didn't know these guys, pretending that he wasn't with them, pretending to, to not know them and just hoping, oh God, hoping that the shooting would stop. And Mr. Getz is going to tell you that he found that amusing. He found it amusing that Daryl Cabey was pretending not to know them. And boom! Shoots at him too. Now, miraculously, that bullet didn't hit Daryl Cavey. He looks at Daryl Cavey and he takes out the gun and he says, you don't look so bad, here's another one. And he fires a shot, boom! Point blank at Daryl Cavey as Daryl Cavey is sitting there helpless and cowering in the seat. And in that last second as Daryl Cavey saw the gun, he turns and the bullet enters his back. I have a lot of respect for Ron Cuban. He's a brilliant, devoted, hard-driving lawyer who we've locked horns several times when we talked about this case. In the civil trial, he was the captain. He's a formidable opponent. In his opening statements, Getz's lawyer posited that the one on trial should be Darrell Cabey, not Bernard Getz. Darrell Cabey is asking for $50 million. And when you consider the facts of the case, the most important thing to consider is is he asking for $50 million solely because of his injuries, or is there another element here? Is he asking for $50 million because he chose the wrong man on that day? For the first time since the 1984 shooting, Bernard Getz testified under oath. Darrell Cabey, the teen paralyzed from the waist down, watched from his wheelchair. The strategy that I chose was not to offer competing narratives, not to say, well, Getz says all of these things, but all these other people say all these very different things, so choose who you believe. Because that would still allow the audience, which wasn't the jury, this was, it was televised, there was daily coverage on multiple stations, to allow the audience of the American people to make a choice. If anyone expected apologies from subway gunman Bernie Getz, they've been sorely disappointed. Did you state on videotape that when you started firing, your intention was to kill them? Yes. Did you say on videotape that your intention was to, quote, murder them? Close yes. Quote. Did you say on videotape that your intention was to make them suffer as much as possible? Yes. And it's fair to say that you were being vicious. Is that right? Uh, yes. And it's fair to say that you were trying to do anything that you could to hurt them. Is that right? I was trying to get as many as I could. Gets coolly described the event. He said he shot to kill, not because one of them had demanded $5, but because of Canty's demeanor and facial expression. Our entire civil trial was based on showing the jury Bernard Getz's own words and statements uh, over a period of time. Once he made those statements where he acknowledged that he was not in fear for his life, once he acknowledged that Daryl Cabey didn't do anything to him, didn't even get out of the subway seat, was just quote unquote with the other guys as though that was deserving of some sort of death sentence, uh, that he didn't think he was being mugged, and that he had been waiting for this moment for years with his little 38 gripped in his hands. When I saw the smile on his face and the shine in his eyes that he was enjoying this, I knew what they were going to do. Is that what you said? Uh, yes. And is it also fair to say that at that point, you decided you were going to, quote, kill them all, murder them all, do anything. I snapped. You saw a gleam in the eye, a shine in the smile. Uh, that's enough to get somebody killed in, in, in Getz land. Getz spoke about two other incidents before the shooting in which he did not fire his gun when he felt threatened and verbally abused, and one in which he believed a white panhandler deserved to die. And you pulled the gun? Uh, yes, I spun around and pulled the gun out. And you said, uh, I'm going to blow you away. Is that right? 
I, or I should blow you away, something like that. Mm -hmm. And you described him then as, as scared <laughs> is that correct? Uh, yes. By the way, he was a white guy, if you want, if that would interest you. Excuse me, Judge. And you also said he deserved to die. Did you not? <sighs> well... Excuse me, Mr. Getty. Did you also say that he deserved to die? Uh, well, he was acting like such an asshole. I did say that, and I felt it at the time. And why did he deserve to die, Mr. Getz? Because he was acting like a total asshole. And in your view, people that you perceive to be assholes should be killed? Well, in many cases, it might make the world a better place. He wasn't prepared properly, in my view. And he certainly hurt himself. It's clear that because of Bernie's compulsive truth-telling, that he's a lawyer's nightmare, but he's a jury's dream. The fact of the matter is that juries love guys like Bernie because they don't have to wonder, is this guy telling the truth? Is he holding something back? Is there something we're not gonna know about? You know, he's an unguided missile, and he says things that are not always in his best interest. Darrell Cabey was incapable of giving testimony. His mother, Shirley, spoke in his stead. She describes her son's life since the shooting. Does Daryl go out with friends? Oh, no. Does Daryl have any girlfriends? No. He was conscious and he could speak, but he functioned at the level of an eight-year-old. Mrs. Cabey told the jury that her son basically needed help with everything. He couldn't stand, walk, or dress himself. He was now spending most of his time glued to the TV. My son was shot um, by Bernard Getz, December 22nd, and uh, our whole life just changed. Obviously, if any of these four individuals were sympathetic, it would be someone who had been made into a cripple by a bullet that was fired from Bernie Getz's gun. Uh, and this is something that his civil counsel and his civil trial was able to capitalize on. Ms. KB, who is Daryl's primary it's, caretaker? Okay, I am. And if something were to happen to you, who would take care of Daryl? I worry about that every day. Well, subway gunman Bernhard Getz shot from the hip. Then he shot from the lip. And soon a Bronx jury will decide if Getz will have to pay for it. He's being sued for $50 million by Daryl Cabey, who was paralyzed in the subway shooting. And things got pretty heated as both sides presented their closing arguments today. Getz's lawyer told the jury his client may be a jerk for uttering racist comments, but he had acted out of fear. And then you realize from the sm smile of this person, and you realize that you're in this life-threatening situation, and you snap. That's it. You go. You just work on instinct. You just start firing. You just sweep right across. In his closing arguments, the defense admitted that Getz's own words damned him but that he should not be condemned for what he thinks, but for what he does. You can say whatever you want about Bernie Getz, but the one thing you can't say is that the man is a liar. What did Daryl Cavey do to Bernard Getz? Nothing, ever. What did Bernard Getz do to Daryl Cavey? You shot him in the back. The jury decided Getz was liable for $43 million in damages and awarded Daryl Cavey 18 million for pain and suffering and 25 million for punitive charges. I was not surprised, given the reports about the way the testimony was going. Um, and it, it, it was expected. I know that QB was going to go for blood, and he drew it. The head of a civil rights group says he's outraged by the verdict in the Bernie Getz civil case. Roy Ennis of CORE said the verdict gives criminals the okay to go out and commit crimes. Darrell KB is a common street criminal that deserved whatever he got. Everyone knows it. Everyone knows that he was in the process of committing a crime, a robbery. How does he get rewarded by our system of justice for his criminal acts? Bernhard Getz filed for bankruptcy today in Manhattan court, a week after a Bronx jury ordered him to pay Daryl Cabey $43 million. Today's emergency bankruptcy petition delays any collection of Getz's assets until a trustee discusses his financial worth with creditors. Those assets, however, were worth only $17,000 in total. Hoffman says the emergency filing will help protect Getz's belongings, but does not affect the $43 million judgment.
We all realize that Mr. Getz can't possibly pay the entire judgment, but Mr. Getz is going to have to work for a living. Those wages are attachable. Mr. Cavey will be his partner, in a sense, for the rest of Mr. Getz's life. This debt was not discharged in bankruptcy, but we monitored Getz's finances, and, and there was just really nothing there. In 2001, Getz ran unsuccessfully for mayor of New York City as an independent. I would keep drugs illegal, uh, but, but enforcement would be relaxed. I also believe strongly that society would benefit greatly from vegetarianism. Four years later, Getz made another run for public office, this time for public advocate, but lost and completely disappeared from the public eye. Nearly 30 years later, the so-called subway vigilante stepped back into the limelight when Trayvon Martin, a young unarmed black man, was fatally shot by neighborhood watch leader George Zimmerman in February 2012 while walking home from a 7-Eleven. Despite their differences, both Getz and Zimmerman described the same motives for their crime, fear and anger. I think George Zimmerman is probably the, the, the most appropriate comparison. Uh, where we hear a narrative and we don't know, and then we hear more details and realize Trayvon Martin died because he had a bottle of iced tea and some Skittles. And just like Getz, George Zimmerman claimed self-defense. I have no problem letting you know that George Zimmerman is not a Bernard Getz. George Zimmerman is not a uh, freedom fighter. He's not a a defender of, of the public. One of the key differences between the Getz case and the Trayvon Martin case, which it has often been compared to, it is more contemporary. George Zimmerman initiated the situation, whereas Getz was reacting to a situation which was initiated upon him. The case carried the same public and media fascination, allegations of racism, profiling, vigilantism, and political expediency. We, the jury, find George Zimmerman not guilty. Zimmerman was acquitted of second-degree murder in 2013. The young men get shot on that subway train were later either locked up or suffered from addiction. One of the men, James Ramser, was found dead in a suicidal overdose in 2011 on the 27th anniversary of the shooting. That same year, Getz made headlines when he was arrested for allegedly selling $30 worth of marijuana to an undercover officer. Getz rejected a plea deal offer involving 10 days of community service, calling the case baloney, certain that the prosecutors wouldn't bring it to trial. The charges were later dismissed. These days, Bernhard Getz still lives in the same building he inhabited back in 1984. He spends his days playing with squirrels. He collects squirrels. Who do you know collects squirrels from the nearby Union Square Park and has them running through his apartment as they gather up the nuts? The guy is truly an eccentric. 